Do we need to review Zoom procedures? Uh, no, I think we should be all set. Only Sean is online. Oh, hey, Sean. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi, Sean. Okay. Um, let's see. Would anyone like to move approval of the agenda? Hold that hand. Great. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion Great. by Gabe, second by Maria. Okay. Um, okay. So comments from the chair. So did you just want to touch on two items? I um, guess the first is... The Elks Club, Gabe met with, oh, wait, we don't have any, oh, okay. Yeah, I guess the public input session is late, okay. Um, are you here for the public input session or did you have, okay, good. Just making sure there weren't other, you know, usually we have like a public comment section. Um, That's number four. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, general business, okay. I'm a little out of it. <laughs> I'm flustered because I was in line for a long time at Kidney Drugs. Um, uh, so, okay. So before we do general business, um, Gabe met with Stephen Whitaker to discuss the, he wanted to discuss the Elks Club. And um, I know we briefly touched upon that at our last meeting. Um and I guess what I didn't understand, I remember, Mike, you were talking about how they've really changed the designations now statewide. Um, but I didn't realize that, I guess, part of the reason this, I mean, maybe you, you probably said this and I just <laughs> didn't pick up on it. Part of the reason the expansion was denied was because, if I understand this correctly, the Elks Club wasn't in our current city plan but it is in this we do touch upon it in this plan right yes um and so were you saying that like the city's plan is or the city's idea is to wait for hearing about new designations or do you have a idea of what designation will i'm just trying to think about is our city plan well poised to meet what might be forthcoming and i was a little unclear on that so that's going to be the tricky part because the act 181 eliminated the programs that exist today and there's going to be new programs that are going to come up to replace them but we don't know what they are and we don't know what the rules are going to be to apply for them and then separately you're going to have the um act 250 exemptions are going to be tied to what those are, and they're going to fall into like tier 1A, tier 1B, tier 2, and tier 3. So tier 1A. You have until 2027 to use the current. Yeah, the current ones will be there till 2027. And then in theory, some of them will automatically, our understanding is, will automatically roll into the new program city centers town centers so yeah so our designated downtown they're not going to have to go back and reapply as far as we know but again we don't have the new designations we don't have the new rules but the thought is you know montpelier alive is still going to be montpelier alive and they're still going to exist um because there are designated downtown that program will may have a different name but it will continue as far as we know the question starts to come up with um neighborhood designations which we don't have growth centers which we do have are expected to be phased out we don't know what that means and what they're going to be replaced with but so we don't quite know whether the language in our or the proposed language in our city plan will meet <laughs> and so are, we, are we going to know before final passage of the city plan no. and i also know there's all this other stuff swirling around so i'm trying to write it generally so most of this is in the land use plan which is our last chapter that we have to do um the last three are community services resilience and land use so we have community services ready to go 
resilience, I have written up the implementation plan and I have sent that to uh, John Copans, who is with the Montpelier um, Resiliency and Recovery Commission. He's their executive director. I'm going to be working with him to review that to kind of make sure things are we're on the same page. Um, and I'm currently today, I was writing the storyboard for resilience. I was also, uh, I also put together some land use maps that I need to have my staff develop. So I gave him a bunch of maps to start putting together so we can start mapping it out. And that's where we start getting into, okay, well, what do we want to put on the map and how do we want to describe it? So one of them is going to be existing designations. And if we're going to go and amend our growth center, which, as I've um, tried to point out, unlike a design, unlike a designated downtown, unlike a new town center, unlike an NDA neighborhood designated area, growth centers have an expiration date. They're they're good for twenty years. So ours was just renewed, or would have just been renewed this year. So we have another five more years. So the question is, how much work is it going to be? How much is it going to cost? to do the amendment um, that would be necessary to add in that uh, country club road property. And that's the hard part. That's what we're trying to figure out. Versus the new, waiting for the new rules. Versus waiting for the new rules, because, you know, uh, it's, it's unfortunate. I don't think there was any advantage to what happened. We had already, we were approved and, you know, for reasons that are beyond me, Stephen decided he wanted to go and, and have that revoked. And to, to no advantage of anything that I can tell. Um, so it, you know, that it, the, the rules that the state were using were inconsistent with statute. So we were following what were the state rules. The state rules were inconsistent with statute. So they did end up uh, revoking it, but it, it serves no useful purpose um, other than to stop development on the Country Club Road property. So... Um, yeah, I it'll asked, cost, I it'll cost them. us, it'll cost us, it'll cost us maybe $40,000 to reapply. I that's the concern. Them. That's taxpayer dollars. I got to ask the taxpayers right. in, in a, in an area where we got I mean, very high before. budgets. We've had lawsuits. We've had all kinds of things right in the city. And I asked him about, I mean, he, he could come in some other time and speak for himself, but he said he felt like that we weren't following. And I'm, I, I don't know that much about it, Mike, because it's never come through here. Like you guys were already doing public input sessions to the Elks Club way before I ever joined the commission. That was stuff was already, you had had multiple meetings, I think, before I ever got here. Um, but I, I guess there was some recommended paths forward and he feels like we weren't following whatever the next steps were for due diligence or something. So he's, you know, his point was that these things should come through the planning commission. I don't know if they should or shouldn't, but the, I asked him that exact question while we were about to get the growth center designation and why, and it was because he didn't want you know us to get ahead of ourselves and we didn't have a plan on how to execute. That's what he, that's what he said. Yeah. So, Which, but yeah, I, you know, I, I agree, it's, right? It's yeah. taxpayer dollars and yeah, now it's going to cost a lot. And the question right. is, do we, do we spend, do we even, do, do we, do we want to spend 30 or $40,000 in right. taxpayer dollars for a three and a half year approval? Right. And those are the questions that we're going to have to come up with. And maybe it's not going to be, we're working, we're negotiating with this, with the state right now to see if there's a middle ground that we can meet at that would go through and say, we can update the plan. We can update the growth center and kind of meet in the middle mm. on, on the, the discussion. But that was, that's TBD to be determined yeah. and we'll figure that out. Yeah. Um, I, I spoke with Alex Farrell last week and yeah. You know, from the state's point of view, they are hoping that we reapply. I mean, then maybe we won't, but for the planning commission, like the one thing that we can do is make sure that this city plan is done as soon as possible. Right. Right. Yeah. And the, the issue that we have is um, not only trying to make sure we, we put into the city plan what we want, but this takes a long time to do these things. So we have to be thinking, of the what ifs as well. What what can we do to try to make things a little bit bigger or different? Like we said, we adopt the uh, city plan in 2017, December of 2017, almost 2018, not knowing that in 2022, we would purchase the Country Club Road and want to put housing on it and need to have it in the growth center in order to be eligible for TIF and 
needing the TIF in order to make the project move forward. And so basically what ended up stopping the growth center applications is that particular parcel is not identified in the city plan, even though the spirit of everything that we're trying to accomplish, it wasn't actually on the map. And according to the statute, it has to be on the map. And that was why, it's, <laughs> and that, well, that's, but the thing is in the future, we don't, we don't want to be, we don't want to have to keep coming back. Un unlike a zoning regulation, we could go through and say, oh, we need to get this fixed because there's a project coming in that needs to go. Yeah. We could do an interim set of zoning regulations and get it changed in about four to six weeks. Changing city plans, there is no interim amendment to a zoning, uh, to, a, to a city plan. So you have to go through a much longer process, which includes uh, reports, amending all of the, the entire document needs to be updated. We tried this once in 2017. We needed to readopt the city plan in order to adopt the zoning that we had worked for six years to get ready. And because it had taken so long through the public hearing process, all of a sudden we were running out of time on our city plan. And then people who were opposed to the zoning changes recognized that and pushed it to the limit. And then when we went to update the city plan, they said, you, according to statute, you need to follow all of these rules and you've got to amend the entire plan before you can readopt it. And so that added months to that process. So um, can't you can't just go through. Yeah, it's, we, it's, we made a new map and it looks like this. Yeah, it's like somebody goes through and says, oh, look, we got, uh, you know, we got this great project that can come up. Can we move this? Can we can we do something to help this project move forward? The fastest a city plan can move is like six months. And that would be really fast. You're probably looking at nine months to a year to amend the city plan, which means um, as we're trying to 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 be flexible, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, so what we want to do with the city plan is start thinking about, all right, are there ways that we can go through and say, this is what we want, but can we buffer that a little bit? To give ourselves some room in the event something comes up that we're able to go through and say, you know, just because we put it in the plan that says we want this in the growth area, it doesn't actually mean we're going to put it in the growth area. It's kind of a buffer that goes around it that says if something changed and we'll have to have that conversation. How do we get over that? And, you know, the getting to the Elks Club question that, you know, we're just, we're stuck where we are right now and we'll figure it out. Um, and we'll make a path working with city council as to how they want to do it and how much funds they want to expend to, to get this going. Um, but it definitely puts, definitely puts um, a crimp in things because, you know, um, we actually found out through this process that what we thought was exactly the opposite. We thought we could continue to move forward on the TIF, but we wouldn't have the Act 250 exemptions. We actually have the Act 250 exemptions, but we can't move forward on the TIF. And the TIF is actually one of the key pieces we need. So otherwise, otherwise the taxpayers have to pick up the payment. So, you know, this becomes, So you can't know, move forward on the TIF because of the growth center. You need to have a growth center. That needs to be in the growth center in order to- Act 250 exemptions apply regardless? The Act 250 exemptions actually apply regardless. Um, it was it's distance from a growth it's center. It's distance from the existing growth center, which is currently Sabin's Pasture. So we actually, because there's a, within a quarter mile of an existing growth center gets included, okay. we are actually included in the Act 250 exemption because we are close enough to, yep. And NDA so, wouldn't get us there? Hmm? NDA, like the neighborhood development area? That's where the question comes up. What do we do? Uh -huh. Do we do we go with a different designation? Do we, you know, if, if I have to reapply, why would I reapply for a growth center expansion? If I've got to spend $40,000, I should do a town, new town center. The new town center doesn't have an expiration date, but will oh. cost me the same amount of money to apply. Oh, I see. So that's where we start ending up with these questions of how do we describe it in the city plan? Because we don't want to be so prescriptive in the city plan that we say growth center and new town center. Mm -hmm. We end up with new and state designations in a year right? or two that have different names. And then the Stephen Whitakers come out of the woodwork and say, well, that doesn't count because it's the wrong name. Right. And now you've got to spend a year amending your city plan to change the name because it doesn't match 
So we have to be general enough that we don't tie our hands, but specific enough that it actually can be used to get us there. Um, now, I thought you could get a TIFF that wasn't in a growth center because Stephen Whitaker forwarded me the long memo that I read and I thought it said at the end that you could. No, nope, we no. When that was oh. what we had thought too, but in the end, it, you we can't. Oh, okay. Um, you have to meet two of the three requirements and we only meet one of them. So we technically don't get ourselves in. Okay. So I have another question. So if we um, decide not to pursue like a new application for the growth center boundary, does that mean that no construction will start until the state provides the new rules for, I mean, don't, that don't, uh, don't know. It'll be, it's a don't know. We are, we do have the money to move forward on due diligence and getting things ready. So unless we're told otherwise, uh, the, the plan is to move forward with engineering and designing all the utilities, sewer, road, everything up to the site, which is what we'd plan to do anyways. Um, so those pieces may be prepped and ready to go, but we can't, we didn't want to go to find a developer until we had TIFF because it would be very important for the developer to know yeah. how we're going to pay for the infrastructure in the site. As it turns out, we're not going to be able to get TIFF, so that piece is probably put off. It's at least put off a year because we can't, we won't even start doing a TIFF until we can get the growth center, so that won't be till next summer. And my other question is like, I mean, I keep sitting in front of these maps. <laughs> is there, is the city putting stuff like this together? I guess maybe this is like before. That was like that was a private years. developer that was putting that putting okay. those ideas this together. Like, this their a random proposal that just yep. fell into their lap. Okay. Yep. It was just, well, they they just wanted to put together a proposal, and we said we weren't there yet. Um, the process is that we want to go to whether it's a master developer or whether it gets subdivided and get other developers. That'll be up to city council to decide how that right. process actually happens for the development, but. In the very least, we need to know we've got the TIF because we're going to need to build up the roads and the sewer and the water. Um, we're going to try to get grants to get the water, sewer, and roads to the site. But I thought you said we could start on that already. We can start getting to the site, and we're starting the design work, designing. the designing and the engineering, and we're applying for grants to try to build the road out. We don't know how much we'll be able to get. Um, if it'll be enough to to build that out. Well, well, there's a lot we still need to learn, but that's what we're working on. But what we do know is because we can't get the TIF, you know, at best the TIF wouldn't be something we, we wouldn't be able to start till next summer, which probably means not looking for developers until next year's 2025, not till 2026 to find a developer. So it it definitely put us off for a year, it, it without a doubt. It yeah. would bump the year. The question is, how much does that hurt? Sounds like it hurts about a year. <laughs> it hurts. It, it, it <laughs> definitely hurts. hurts for us. Definitely hurts well, for us I mean, who are working on it. But the it's... council might decide to sell the parcel too, right? Piece, a piece of it, oh, just a piece? Yeah, there's okay. a discussion of a piece of it. Okay. That would be um, for the council to figure out. Um, so anything else on the growth center? Um, and I know we want to get to the public input session, so I'll just quickly mention that Marie and I had a nice uh, meeting with two members of the Homelessness Task Force um, just to connect about the bike safe, bike path safety issues. Um, and I, you know, I think they're some, you know, somewhat concerned that we're demonizing or maybe demonizing is too strong a word, um, you know, uh, disparaging disparaging um or well i i don't know we are disparaging the behavior <laughs> but I mean, but we don't know who it is the entire population. yes exactly we don't want to yeah um but then kind of touched on some of the issues with they're just around the river there are you know pockets of um hangout areas and and you know what how can we address that um through other solutions. And anyway, I think just to mention that we 
you know, connected with them. And I think we're going to stay in touch. And, you know, should the planning commission try to move forward on any recommendations around the bike path, we would, we would connect with the homelessness task force certainly before doing that. I don't know, Maria, anything else you want to? No, I think it was a good meeting. Um, just try to make sure you my microphone <laughs> just so the public can hear us. Um, I mean, that was the, the result of the meeting is that we kind of agreed that we would share information between the two committees, the commission and the committee. They're a committee, not a commission. I guess. They're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I mean, it was helpful because I, I think Zach confirmed that it was a, it was a combination of, um, people who do have homes also hang out there. You know, it's not just like a certain population that's hanging out there, which I think goes back to what I hope is our recommendation to improve the planning of that entire area and make it more lively and increase safety that way, as opposed to, you know, villainizing a certain group. So, yeah. yeah, and I... I was wondering, I mean, we are considering the public safety oh, that's community today. justice. I mean, well, I don't know if it's- I think too... public safety, we had this discussion. Oh, we did. Okay. That public safety actually meant the public safety departments, not actual public safety. That, that was like one of my first meetings on the oh, commission. Okay. 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 So we didn't just say this last <laughs> time and I completely forgot. Yeah. I just, yeah. I mean, I was wondering, is it something that we could- put into the city plan in terms of like just kind of having an ongoing awareness of where these pockets are that might feel unsafe to people and and how to you know make recommendations or think about the design and planning of the those spaces but anyway tbd yeah <laughs> okay so now we can move on to general business um comments from the public on something that's not on the agenda so um oh. yeah. please come forward to the mic and introduce yourself <laughs> um i'm laura la rosa i live in montpelier and i wanted to um know just quickly because this isn't actually why i came I came for the public <laughs> input session but it's about the growth center application so there were two at least two people who were concerned about the growth center application. I was one of them. And my concern was that it also included like residential 9,000 neighborhoods, which is something I hadn't heard about before. I, I Not the 9,000 neighborhoods. I know what they are because I live in one. I didn't know that there was a plan to include residential 9,000 neighborhoods in the growth center. And I found it confusing because I, I didn't think there, there was really any information explaining why you would need the same type of regulations you're looking for in the Elks Club um, property. Why do you want to apply that to just like neighborhoods on sort of the outskirts of town? And um, so people keep talking when they talk about the growth center application, they seem to just focus only on the Elks Lodge. And I have no problem with developing that. I have no objection. I think that's really good. But when you like as a group, the city seems to like omit references to expanding to other neighborhoods. And I find that like uncomfortable. It makes me feel like I'm not getting all the information I should get. So I would just encourage the commission and the city council to think about how you can do better to provide targeted information to neighbors and neighborhoods about changes that might impact them. Because I talked to some people who live on like Town Hill Road. They had no idea that there was this growth center application and they don't know what it means. And so they ask me and I'm, I'm probably providing like incorrect information because I don't have a lot of good information to go from. So. Yeah, I, if I could ask you a question, I'm just curious. Um, sorry, were you done or? I'm done. Okay. <laughs> um, so if somebody asked you about the, I'm just curious where they heard about it. Just oh, again, just I heard about it from the bridge. Like, oh, okay. Oh, like a couple of months ago, the bridge had an article that said, you know, there's going to be this hearing at the community investment board. And I thought, oh, I have no idea why this would apply to a neighborhood like mine. So I went and I objected specifically to like 
my to the residential 9,000 neighborhoods being included. Um, and then like, I have just been following from afar what what's happened. Well, maybe, should we close the door? Close the door? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I heard about it from the bridge. I did go back and I saw that the city council had had this on the agenda, I guess like twice earlier in the year. And I read the agendas, but I just like overlooked this reference to residential 9,000. And I bet a lot of people don't even know that they live in a residential 9,000 neighborhood and agendas could, so one specific suggestion would be that agendas could be more specific to help people understand if an agenda item impacts them. But thank you for your question. Can I ask what your, it sounded like you objected to the residential 9,000 designation for your own neighborhood? Yes. Yeah. Why was that? Um, because from what I read about what the growth center is supposed to mean, so my under, my the impression I got is that it is to do larger scale development than what's currently allowed by our zoning. I don't know if that's a correct assumption, but that's that's what I picked up. Um, and I felt like there wasn't any information provided. And then also when I read about like it's supposed to be for like walkable neighborhoods that are like part of the downtown and the area where I live isn't really, I think, a walkable neighborhood that's connected to the downtown. Only people like walk downtown like on the weekends or if they're like people who are going to work downtown or going shopping downtown are all driving. So I thought it, so it's going to whatever increased development. I'm getting a little like discombobulated on this topic, but I feel like any increased development would just lead to increased traffic and um, traffic safety is a big concern because I think the area where I live isn't very safe for pedestrians already. I mean, that's essentially what I told the community investment board too. Okay, thank you. But thank you for yes. asking. Um, and no, so we probably, you know, I can work with Evelyn to try to do um, more outreach and better outreach. Um, so the growth center, it, it won't, override or change our zoning. Um, we still have to meet our zoning. What it what it would do is exempt developers from the Act 250 process. And it's not always large projects. Uh, Act 250 has some strange triggers to it, how you get into Act 250. It's um, nine units within five miles over five years. So somebody might be a developer who decides to do four, you know, four or five small projects, you know, maybe it's a triplex a year. Well, they would trigger Act 250. And so if you're in a growth center, none of those developments that happen in the growth center count towards triggering that Act 250. So even if they do three projects in Barrie, two projects in Berlin and one in Montpelier, they get triggered. They get, they get tripped in and an Act 250 application can cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars to get in and get through. So the idea was not necessarily to have giant projects in every every neighborhood, but a lot of our developers we have in Montpelier are actually just small developers that do little projects here and there, and they'll do two or three, and they might get tripped thin simply by these, these rules. And so the idea was these neighborhoods mostly, not, not 100%, but a large percentage were already in our growth center in 2009. They were removed in 2016, and we were just working to put them back in. The exception being Country Club Road. Um, that was never in. Um, so that was part of it is there was a little, you know, but yes, we clearly needed to do a better job of of outreach. Um, but it can be it can be tricky on some of these to know how much outreach to connect with people. I mean. We try, we, we work a lot. The bridge does a good job of getting the information out, but it's not, it's not always the, the timing. And sometimes we're kind of in, uh, in under the gun to get an application in. So we're trying to be as quick as we can, try to get as much output. And we're trying to think who could object to this. It's probably not going to be a lot of people, but in the absence of information, people might think this is going to be something bigger than it is. Um, and um, in, in that case, we needed to do a better job of getting the correct information out um, earlier. But, uh, you know, I'll work with 
uh, we always bring these things up. We talk about these things. Um, you know, I'll talk to city manager, talk to Evelyn, who's our communications coordinator. Um, and hopefully we'll do a better job of getting more of the information out going forward on that. Um, but it, it doesn't override the zoning. Um, and in this case, the revised, what had been approved by the board did not include your neighborhood because they only approved areas that had existing sidewalks. So, yeah. Just to, just to follow up on that, yep. but part of their approval did say that if sidewalks were added, then they'd automatically be added in the growth center application. If, yes, if, yeah, we, so. yeah, if we went in, we could add, again, the growth center is only good for three years. So if they built it in three years, they'd have the benefit. But it's just an interesting caveat that would be important to me. Yeah. But I, I really appreciate what you're saying, because one of the, my concerns was, does this override zoning? Because everything I saw about like growth center application said, like, you can have 74 units. And it's like, does that? It's, it's Act 250. So if you were allowed to have 74 units on your property, then you could get to take it. it it's That's where the trigger is for Act 250. Yeah. If you're in a growth center, the trigger was 74 until Act 181, which we had just been talking about. And I had thought it was still 74, but apparently um, with Act 181, it completely exempts properties that are in the growth center from Act 250. Okay. So. Well, thank you. Yes. Yeah, and I, I feel like that's something that maybe at some point if we have extra time on the planning commission, <laughs> we, could, we could do, I mean, I'd love to do, I saw that, once that like Brattleboro did like a walking tour and like had people visualize, you know, here's what this zoning would mean for this parcel. And I just think that's great because I think zoning can be really confusing and and people hear numbers or designations or whatever. And it it can be alarming, but to really look at what the possibilities and the restrictions are, I think would be great. Anyway, okay. Any other general business okay so i think mike is going to introduce our public input session and just um briefly touch upon the three areas that we are uh seeking comment on and then we'll be excited to get some public input hopefully all right and So I'm just going to go through the, the city plan presentation, and then we can decide what chapters we want to go through. Last At the last meeting, we tried to go through all three chapters, and it took a long time. We really didn't get a lot of time for public input. But we'll go through the presentation uh, and then leave open room to, to talk about, and then we can go into any one of the three storyboards or any one of the three uh, implementation plans. So uh, really quick, this presentation, we'll go over the background and history. What is the city plan? Why is it important? Um, it's all in three chapters, two parts. That'll make more sense later when I explain it. We've got, go, we're reviewing three of the 12 chapters tonight. Um, what is our overall input process? And then how the rest of tonight will work. So big question everyone always has, where to find the current plan? We're, we are working on doing an online plan. Um, it's a web-based plan. If you go to the city's website and you scroll down, and I can show this later on, there's a set of boxes. And one of the boxes is city plan 2024. And that will take you to a page uh, that looks like this. And when you scroll down these symbols, there are now nine of these symbols uh, on there. And each of these takes you to a storyboard. And down below, we've got the list of the PDFs. These are the, the, the implementation plans. So every chapter has a storyboard, historic, and every one has an implementation plan. There's historic resources. This is all temporary until we, um, which should be coming up very, very quickly within the next couple of weeks, there's going to be an, a separate website, which will be a little bit more seamless, a little bit more flawless. Um, we had to break it out because we were trying to present it in pieces. And obviously people would get confused if 
three quarters of the plan didn't work and had buttons that didn't work. So we tried to work it this way. So a little bit of background for 50 years, we had the Montpelier master plan. Um, so this is being called uh, the Montpelier city plan. So it's a little bit different, mostly just because master plans are a term of art and uh, we this has never been a master plan. So the planning commission voted uh, at the start of this process that the new plan will be called the Montpelier city plan. Uh, it was most recently updated in 2010 and amended in 2017. They're good for eight years. So uh, it's good till 2025, December of 2025. There's a completely new format and content. Um, and the process started in 2016, developing goals and strategies. We met with uh, various committees and commissions, whoever was responsible for something. So we've got 12 chapters, historic, housing, energy. We also have a lot of committees. So we would talk with the Historic Preservation Commission about historic. And we talk about the housing task force and the housing committee about the housing plan and so forth for all the different chapters. And that was started in 2016 and uh, continued right through till this year. We're still working on the, the last plan. The, uh, it's a web-based plan format, as I mentioned, with separate chapters for each topic. Our current city plan was not organized that way. We think organizing it by 12 chapters is gonna be easier to update it in the future and uh, to discuss uh, strategies. Uh, the new format is also um, has aspirations, goals, and strategies with the goal of having a more actionable plan. So that was one of our, our goals was to not have a lot of things that said we support and encourage things. We wanted to really have an actionable plan, uh, amend the zoning to do this, create a program to do this, have a policy that states this, those types of things. And then... Um, the uh, city plans, as I mentioned, were valid for eight years. So uh, what is a city plan and why is it important? City plans are not required under state law, but you do need to have a city plan if you want to adopt or update your zoning. You do need to have a city plan if you want to take part in Act 250 or Section 248. So um, if the city wanted to participate in one of those hearings to support a project or not support a project, we would have to have uh, a city plan in place. It's also a necessary requirement for many state and federal grants. So that's why it's a good idea to have one. Um, but if you want to have one, you have to meet these four requirements. It has to be consistent with the state planning goals. It has to be compatible with the regional plan. It has to be compatible with other plans in the region. And it has to contain the 12 elements of Title 24. And so you've got 12 elements and 12 chapters. Um, that's part, part of the reason it ends up being that way. Um, and the regional plan will, the regional planning commission will review for read the regional plan and the regional, um, the neighboring community. So that, that will be a part of our review process. So how can a city plan be used? Uh, it can be a long-term guide. Uh, basis for decision-making, action plan with implementation steps, basis for municipal regulations, lots of ways we can use a city plan. Our goals, as mentioned earlier, um, was to have these storyboards, which are kind of web pages that uh, you can see sometimes, um, and we'll go over them to kind of show what they look like, to give uh, the public and decision-makers the background of uh, the topic and what are our goals and generally what are we going to do to achieve them? It's kind of meant to be the 50,000 foot view of an understanding of what is housing? Why is it important in Montpelier? Why is energy? What are we going to do to accomplish our goals on energy? Um, the strategies in the implementation plan are those specific steps that have been worked out with the committees and the planning commission to describe, okay, if these are our goals, these are going to be the steps we're going to need to get there. So the overall process for this plan update, um, this is our public input. This is not a public hearing, it's just input. Um, we've developed 12 chapters. We're actually, 11 chapters are done. I'm working on the 12th right now. Um, we're reviewing them with the public three chapters at a time. It was supposed to take four to six months. We're out about eight months right now, um, but we're hoping to get this wrapped up by the end of the calendar year. Um, so we did them in blocks of three. 
each will have uh, different input opportunities, plus comments online and through surveys. Once complete, the Planning Commission will review all the comments and make final revisions before going to a uh, final public hearing draft. So our, our goal now is to get as many of the issues corrected as we can, any omissions, things we need to address before we go to public hearing so we can have a smooth public hearing process. When ready, uh, a public hearing process will begin with Planning Commission public hearings, and then the council will also have two hearings, at least two hearings. So our topics tonight, natural resources, public safety, and community justice, and economic development. So those uh, public safety and community justice are one group. Um, three chapters in two parts. So as we mentioned, each one has a storyboard. Each one has implementation plans. Um, all nine pieces are on the, the city website, uh, but will eventually be on their own page. Uh, each storyboard has an introduction, plan context, implementation summary. They all follow the same kind of script, so that way they're consistent as you go from storyboard to storyboard. They all follow the same uh, general format. And each implementation strategy follows the same format of an aspiration, goals, um, and then strategies. And the strategies are then actionable items to achieve the goals. So uh, the example we like to use is if you have a, you might have a goal of safe and affordable housing, we'd have a goal for safe housing and a goal for affordable housing um, because the strategies to get safe housing might be different than the, the same strategies for having um, affordable housing. So. Uh, this is a little bit of what they look like. This is the top of the transportation page. This is uh, the implementation plan on the right, the storyboard on the left. And we can go through these um, in a minute, but this is what we're talking about when we talk about the storyboard and the implementation plan. So the rest of tonight, I'm going to leave the PowerPoint. Um, what are we looking for? Um, what we want our opinions, what what do you like, not like about the various elements? Do you have specific comments about the content? Are there specific strategies that are missing? Do you have questions we can answer? Um, we can always take emails later if you choose. Um, really, we're just, we've put this together, working with the committees to try to come up with um, what would be our city plan for moving forward. What is it the city government can do? You won't see action that says, you know, people should, residents should do this or businesses should do that. This is all about what are the actions the city as a government can do to either encourage or incentivize people to do things if that's the situation. So if you have questions or comments, I guess I should have introduced myself. I'm Mike Miller. I'm the planning director for the city. Um, and that's my email address, miller at montpelier-vt.org. So let me jump out here and if we want to take yeah, I think quick comments or... Take some comments um, and we can... And then I can open... Spe specific <laughs> <laughs> chapters, but... Uh, and Tim, Tim is a counselor, but he's here... <laughs> Tim Heaney. Um, all right. Well, let me go back to sharing really quick. All right. So just to quickly orient people again, if you're on Orca watching this later, this is the city's website. If you go to our website, as I had mentioned earlier, if you scroll down, you will find this set of things. You also notice that city planning department has moved to the Leonine building. If you're looking for me, uh, leaf pickup, strategic plan, and there's the city plan. And if you click on the city plan, it will take you to the city plan 2024, which we'll probably eventually have to change to 2025 pretty quick where we have explore the chapters. And here's where I'd mentioned we have these nine storyboards. They'll soon be 12. When we put the last three in, we'll probably actually go to the new website when we put the last three in. Um, and these are the implementation plans. 
Now, I'll point out that we did public safety a little bit different. We actually broke it into its different pieces, dispatch, police, community justice, and fire EMS. Otherwise, it would be like 11 pages of these, and the PDFs are big, so we wanted to keep them uh, of, a, of a reasonable size for pe people to be able to open them and download them. Is there a specific one of these three that you guys want to look at? The Natural Resources Economic Public Safety? Specifically, I have comments about the economic development. Okay, I'll open that one first. Oh, <laughs> what did they do? I tested them this morning. They've moved me. Oh. What did you do to me? Maybe I can sneak in the back door here. Item unavailable. Even in the back door, it's gone. What's that? Zip? No, for the community yeah. services. Yeah, the PDF. Yeah. yeah, the implementation does work. My apologies, that was there this morning. So they maybe somebody in Burlington is working on it. Sorry about that. That was the storyboard. The implementation plan looks like... Um, so the economic development implementation plan looks like this, and all of them follow the same format. So um, on the right, you would have, I got to minimize this, the aspirations, um, which the aspiration for economic development was, uh, and I'll just read them. Montpelier will be a great place for people in the workforce to live because we provide equal access to employment through available housing opportunities, affordable housing and services, child care and transportation, for all members of the workforce and by connecting these workers to the regional and state resources that are available for workforce development. And second, Montpelier will maintain a robust local economy by supporting quality private development and by ensuring those projects have access to ample infrastructure. So the thoughts and the theories that went in behind these two was that there was one aspiration that targeted um, the businesses and the properties um, and that side. And there's one aspiration that is focused on um, the people, the workforce, the labor, um, because to, to be successful, we need to have the businesses be successful and we also need the workers to be successful. So from an economic development standpoint, what do we need to make workers successful? And from an economic development, what do we need to make the businesses successful? Because clearly there are different tools right, that are gonna be needed to help each one of these groups. Um, and then the goals, there are six goals. And I believe the first two focus on the labor and the other four on the businesses. So uh, big picture, the, the goals for what workers need to be successful, we found there were three barriers to workers being successful. And they were um, having affordable housing, having housing, transportation, and childcare. Those are the three big things. So what can we as government do to help make sure those are less of a barrier or not a barrier to uh, individuals who are looking to participate in the workforce? So that was... The, the three big things that we were looking at, obviously there's a lot of things that can impact somebody's ability to participate in, in the workforce, but those were the three big that we felt needed to be addressed. Um, and then there was a second one that kind of came in, or a fourth one that kind of came in a little bit less than that, which was um, trying to make sure workers had access to workforce development. Um, so that's why number one really talks about those those first three. Number two is talking about um, accessing, but we don't, as a city government, provide workforce development. So what can we do to help people access workforce development was what we were trying to get at with number two. And then three, four, five, six are looking at how do we help businesses to be successful, um, continue to improve our business and economic climate to encourage and support businesses various strategies that we have for doing that. Increase the number of local businesses through retention and expansion programs. Um, 
we don't have many, but we do need to increase and improve those as well as improving for startups and entrepreneurs with the goal of increasing the number of jobs by 100 per year. The fifth was improve our building stock to remain it more flexible, efficient, and well-maintained, maintain and improve the quality and supply of our necessary utilities and facilities. So um, recognizing that businesses are one group, not all businesses own their buildings. So uh, having good buildings that are flexible, ready to go, um, will help economic uh, growth, making sure we have the utilities that are available and ready to go will help economic growth. And the last is to maintain and improve our sense of place and quality of the public built environment. And this is a little bit more of the the the, the less of the brick and mortars and more of uh, their successful places. A lot of successful places are successful because they're unique and offer a sense of place. Um, in Montpelier, I think does a good job with that. Um, other places are just um, many times, you know, if you took a picture, you might not know whether you were um, in one town or another, because there's just nothing giving a sense of place. If you got a picture of downtown Montpelier, you know, you're in Montpelier. So we need to maintain that and make sure we don't lose that sense of place. So those are the goals. And then the strategies are all these sent, uh, all these sets of things. And they relate back. You'll see uh, renew the tax increment finance program, just as an example, has its priorities, its cost. Um, and it helps implement goals five and six. Um, develop a housing marketing outreach program. That's also a thing in our housing plan. So it's actually just repeated here. Um, helps us implement goal number one. Um, so that's what all of these are. Um, they highlight which goals they're helping to implement because one strategy may help us accomplish a couple of different goals depending on how that is used. And so we've got a basically a page and a half of these um, of various strategies that have been uh, identified to help with economic development. Is there a specific one you had questions with that you wanted us to? Questions. or comment okay yeah yeah if you, for public for the public to hear you have to be at the microphone um oh um well i guess two things one is the focusing on the outdoor recreation um seems like a really smart move for montpelier to take advantage of i think all of our businesses are great but i noticed onion river outdoors has these amazing events every year like the muddy onion that draw on hundreds of people from across the state and outside of Vermont. And it's like fantastic um, advertising for the city to draw these people in. Um, but the real reason I came is uh, I wanted to highly recommend that you increase or, or bolster the strategies towards improving childcare. It's funny to live in a capital where there's no like child care facility in like the downtown area. We do have child care facilities, but nothing central. And I think it would be, um, this is like, it's easy to say, I know it's hard to do. I, if there's a way to talk to um, the executive branch about like finding a place for state employee um, childcare in one of the many vacant facilities downtown, um, people will travel, people will come into work again if they know that there's a spot for their child in a good um, licensed daycare facility. I know people now who travel from like Topsom and like, I'm not even sure where Topsom is, but they come here <laughs> because they work here and they drop their child off at a daycare center here. Um, that's, in a, you know, that's why they come into to work in Montpelier and you can, um, you know, do the math, like you bring people back into the office for that kind of a benefit and they'll hopefully shop more downtown and eat out more often. So I know it's one of the goals and I think that's great, but it's not really like, uh, I don't, it could be bolstered by a strategy. So I'd encourage you to think more about what could be done there. So there will be more on the, what's coming up in the next chapter is community services. And one of the requirements in community services is childcare. So we do have much more in there, but we should do a better job of making sure we tie this to those strategies to make sure that people know that those exist. And I think, I think the connection or I hope the connection is there in the storyboard that we can't see. Um, 
that has that connection because we do have um, a lot of a lot more targeted okay. suggestions in in the community services chapter, which will be coming up in December. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, I'm Tim Heaney, resident of Montpelier, and um, speaking as a citizen and not as a city council member, hopefully. <laughs> but this is my first. I've been trying to follow this process, and economic development is obviously a key one. Um, the two, I guess I would have comments about are develop a housing and marketing, uh, or housing marketing and outreach program. It's like, I'm just not sure what that's really going to do. We really, housing is a priority that we need to create. And I think we need to maybe have, um, a strategy with a little more power than that. Um, I really feel like part of our issue is with things that have happened in the past that developers and people that want to do things may not view Montpelier as an easy, friendly place to come in and create housing. And um, I think we need to work on that and find ways to to be more appealing to show that yeah, you can create housing here. I know Gabe's working on it and we hope you're successful, but it, it's really, um, we have a really onerous zoning code. Um, it has a nice preamble that says we want to create more housing. And then there's, uh, it's a pretty tough document to navigate after that. Um, I, I, it's something I think we need to update to make it cleaner, simpler, and more effective. And the other piece I would mention is the um, economic development strategic plan. And my comments on that are in previous life, I was on the Montpelier Development Corp, which came out of this plan. Um, and that was a great group that tried to um, help generate some economic development. Unfortunately, I think as a community, we've got to mature and realize that economic development is a long-term plan. It's nothing that's going to happen unless you get really lucky, you know, in six months or a year. So um, I think the words there again are kind of like, okay, they're in the, in the city plan, but I'm not sure if we keep going the way we are with this economic development strategic plan, we're going to go anywhere. Um, that was a really unsatisfactory process uh, with the Montpelier Development Corp. And I think if you'd interviewed any of the people that were in it personally, um, you'd find that once it was formed, some aspects of the city really didn't want it or favor it um, and didn't include it in development activities and conversations that were happening. And so it was like formed and then left out there and said every few months, we want a progress report as if everything was going to happen in six months. Um, and I think if that's the attitude we're going at this with, you might as well remove that because it, it really wasn't good. So I think we can be really positive and, and enhance bringing businesses into town, um, but this piece isn't the way to do it. I have a question, a follow-up question. So it, it sounds to me like the develop housing marketing and outreach program you think isn't going far enough. Like marketing to developers is not what the city needs to do. The city needs to actually right. create better zoning rules like, I, I think you're you're saying like the marketing isn't the issue <laughs> correct the marketing is not the issue the and, zoning rules and developers are a pretty small group and they're paying attention following the economy seeing where opportunities are if they see that this is a place that you can create housing that there's reasonable rules they can work with we have capacity for water sewer schools and all our infrastructure it could be a great place to create housing um, but for some reason, there's a, a billboard out there where we've stopped enough projects where people just go, you know, I, I don't want to do it there. And we've got to break through that. And, and I also think developers aren't a crowd that you're going to bring to a boot camp. I mean, it's it's a pretty small group and they work independently. Um, it'd be interesting to see who would show up if you had one. But yeah. 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 I think that's what they were trying to get at the housing committee with, with the, the negative opinions of working in Montpelier. And the thought was, you know, if, if, if we do some of the other housing initiatives to, you know, whether it's streamlining the zoning or, um, but whatever, we could do all the great things in the world, but if our reputation is still bad, we need to market to people to go and say, Hey, this is, you know, this is a good place. We've got the mm -hmm. sewer, we've got the water, we've got the, well, maybe it's a, the, the TIF district, or maybe it's whatever it is, we have to start selling it if we're going to get developers in. I think once projects start, 
we don't need to continue that program. No need to spend money marketing to people. Once people see projects happening, That's they're going to, the they're going to come in to figure out, Hey, why, why is, why is so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so working on a project here? There must be something yep. working right now and nothing's working. So that's why it, that they wanted the marketing program. Um, and somebody noted the boot camp. That's why that reference is in there. Um, I, you know, as I said, I, I think the state has come up with a, a new manual now. They're trying to encourage new people to get in and they actually have a manual now. You know, if you're interested in getting into the housing construction industry, here's, here's how you start and do your business. You know, it's an actual book. We've got a couple copies in my office. Um, and so it's meant to try to help get people in the door to start because we just don't have enough builders. Um, and so that would, that would help getting more builders. Um, so, um, but yes, I recognize, I, I agree with you. Um, but, uh, some of the housing things will come out of the housing plan. We, these were just one of the ones that we thought would be good here because also, our builders are also part of economic development, whether they're building housing or whether they're building businesses, builders and developers themselves are part of our economic base. And we need more of them. Yeah. We're only building a couple houses a year. Yeah. We're, not, we're not getting there. We, we, we need more. We do. Can I ask a follow up question? So are you, is your recommendation to just strike these or to strengthen them? I wasn't clear. I mean, I'd like them to be there because housing's a key goal for our community. I'm just not, I'm not feeling like these are the right, strategies to create the housing um, and the economic development strategic plan. I mean, the concept is great, but we've got to really put something behind it to make it happen. And an economic development at the bigger scale, it, it's, it's a hard thing to plan. I mean, opportunities happen and you have to be prepared to take advantage of them when the right people are there and when something can happen. It's really hard to, to schedule it on the timeline you want it to happen. I mean, and that's one thing I've learned in my career. I've been amazed at how many times a large company is searching for a property or a space and they'll just walk into our office. You know, there's no appointment and they'll have three people from three different parts of the country and nobody called ahead and they're here to find a space or an opportunity for their business. And it's just the way it works. And if you're not ready to roll with it when it happens, they go to Berlin or they go to Barry or they, wherever they end up. So um, it's just, you've got to have everything planned and ready to take advantage of the opportunities when the developer arrives or when the business arrives. Yeah. You need, you need to have somebody who's there in the office who knows where the vacancies are, what do we have as, as available Great. so we can connect people up or maybe it's something that we aren't well suited for, but there's somebody else in the County that might be, as you know, we used to go and say, you know, somebody might show up, want five acres and, you know, 40,000 square feet. And we're like, well, we don't really have that. Um, but here are a couple of places you could go and look where, because we don't want to lose them to somewhere else. If if they don't fit from Montpelier, it's, it's not bad to have it go to Berlin or Barry City. Like you can go around the country and find places that built, they built the factories so that people would bring their businesses there, you know? So, I mean, these are the kinds of things I think that we got to talk about. Do we want to do that? Yeah. So piggybacking off of that, it sounds to me like the strategy is aimed at the public, convincing the public that economic development is worth our while. Because I mean, education is focused on the public, not on... There is a component that is uh, focused on the public because we have had, this was, and this came up, whether it's conversations with our, the the MDC, the Montpelier Development Corp, that that bolded or economic developers who worked in our city or um, associated with it, there's, there's not a lot of public support behind a lot of the economic development projects. And, and you get, you get a number of headwinds. Um, there'll be a lot of people that support it, but you also get some headwinds. And sometimes that's enough to turn off a developer or, or to point them into a different direction. And sometimes we just have to explain to the and educate the public what economic development is and why, as we pointed out here, economic development is what's good for people and what's good for business. And we can't offer good jobs if we don't have the businesses that provide them. Um, and right. so we kind of need to have these two working together. We can't have successful businesses if we don't have a good workforce that complements that, that business that's trying to move in. 
So Mike, can I just clarify process, right? We've done the, the initial three chapters. You guys, your team put those all on a spreadsheet and then had some re staff recommendations. And then you brought that back to another meeting where we would have time to talk about it again, right? So these comments from Tim, we'll talk about again. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We'll, we will be back to, to take these and any other comments that we get on economic development that we and, can go and through. And you as well. And get, get, <laughs> I, I, I can't remember your name. Laura. Laura. Yeah. So we can get a, yeah, we can go back and, and I, I agree with Tim. I think that the EDSP, most of us agree that that particular document is not very good. And I think we needed to have a better document. And I think the way this is worded, when Tim mentioned it, I read it, it's like update and implement a new economic development strategic plan. I think we could do a better job with that description. That title might be okay, but we should do a better job with the description to say, you know, this, this needs to be a new product. Mm -hmm. We need to go and develop a new EDSP to talk about, you know, what, what we want to do, because again, um, we can't recommend strategies if we don't have you know, the overall goal in place of what it is we're trying to do. Can I, and, can I just and ask, we're gonna have a tough time with our downtowns. So since, since Tim happens to be here, did you guys have an, I, I don't know the background on it. Did you have an executive director? Do you have full-time staff that were supporting it or is it just community? Yeah. We hired, we, we did hire executive director. You hired three of them, I think. And we had okay. time to keep them. <laughs> All for personal reasons. It wasn't Montpelier. Yeah, it was uh, hard. Yeah, it was. You guys but, did a good yeah. job picking people. It just, it just was, didn't was stay. really hard it, to get. It was one person, or yeah, it was one person. Okay, so that would be the equivalent of Josh. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and that's why now, when when Kevin Casey left and the position reopened, and we had Josh come in we changed his position to be a community and economic development specialist, as opposed to just a community development specialist. He's a community and economic development specialist because he was, he worked for community capital. He worked for um, Barry, uh, Barry Area Development. So he's done economic development. That's actually his bread and butter is economic mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. So um, we're, we were very excited to have him and be ready to have him jump in and do a lot of economic development. And then and we like three months later, it floods. <laughs> so he's been writing a lot of grants for we us. We will get him back. Yeah. He, he, he's doing a great job and, but eventually he wants to, and we want to have him get back to economic development. So getting the plan in place will help to kind of steer how things go. And I think there, there are a lot of issues which are discussed in our storyboard that, you know, um, Things have changed. I mean, our last plan was 2018, 2017. You know, that's that's before COVID. That's before remote work from all the um, all all of that issue. You know, back in 2018, we were worried about parking. We don't worry about parking. Um, you know, now we're we've got other other issues. How do we keep our businesses? We've got more vacancies in our downtown. We have a flood. How are we going to go and fill these spaces? Um, and that, that's going to take somebody with, uh, it's going to take a vision of what we want to try to get to and, and some skills on an investment on, on getting there. And I think that's why economic development, uh, it was just a, by way of background for, for many, many years, it wasn't until maybe 2016 or 17 or 18 economic development wasn't even a required plan in, in city plans. It wasn't even a required chapter. So, uh, we've had it. But it's it, it's it's only been recently that it's really been a, a chapter, and it's you know it's important. It's why we've got it here. Um, but we do need to build this out um, as to our our directions and what are what are the barriers to to success, and whether that's regulatory barriers or um, public or just mm -hmm. infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the things I, I know you're still working on the whatever we're going to look at next, right? But as this feeds into the resilience, I mean, yes, we wanted a resilience chapter. I, I know it's been a couple of months since I brought it up. I think part of the resilience is the fact that we probably aren't going to have 4,000 workers coming into all these state buildings again. And so it is economic resilience. It's not just re resilience against the, you know, the wind and the rain. It's resilience about how, how do we keep everything afloat? We don't want, you know, 2019 to be the high water mark of what Montpelier could be, right? But it's going to take some thinking about. I don't know if that's already part of what you're 
preparing it, resilience, for resilience or not. It's but. heavily flood, but it yeah. does recognize that resilience, resilience is resilience from anything. And we've, you know, as we, it's mentioned in there that, um, you know, pandemics and, um, you know, we've been around long enough to terrorism in, in different parts of the country. I mean, there, there's a lot of things that could end up being a factor that we've got to deal with. Um, storms, heat waves, lots of stuff that can, you know, some of them may be just small bumps, but at the same time, you need to be resilient. You can't have um, businesses going down. And I, I think the flood is one of the big ones. Um, but obviously the pandemic was huge for, for us. Um, it wasn't just a matter of getting ourselves re recalibrated to pandemic comes to an end and nobody comes back to work. Um, so that's certainly a, a factor that um, we need to be aware of going forward is, you know, it could be, you know, in the past, it could have been big box retailers could have been a, a discussion point for resilience. What are we going to do with our downtown if these big box retailers keep drawing customers away? Can I ask a question about the difference between plan, the program, and project? Yes. So one of the things we did is we had um, to try to keep people when we were starting this is we wanted to make sure people were talking, when we were talking about a strategy, it had to be a, had to be a thing. And so there were five P's um, plans, um, which are, you don't, we don't understand what it is. So in the next eight years, we got to study this issue because we don't have an answer for it. Uh, programs are ongoing things. So um, uh, tax stabilization is a program. It's an ongoing thing. Um, the, the permits are what you'd expect. They're the regulations. So sometimes the best way to accomplish a goal is through regulations. And if we had natural resources up, a lot of your natural resources, how, you know, how do we prevent water pollution and all these other things? A lot of it's through regulations. Um, so that's permits. Policies are how we spend our money um, as a government. So what we do with our resources. So we don't need to pass a law or have a program in order to um, make City Hall net zero. We just have to go and have a policy that we're going to do it because it's it's there or how we use our staff. You know, so really policies are all about how we operate, how we spend our money. Um, so they're kind of in their own group. And so let me try to remember now, plans, policies, programs, projects. Projects are the last one. Projects are things you do once. So we might have a project of uh, Country Club Road. We're only going to do one of those. Build a transit center. We're only going to do one of those. Um, so sometimes the solution to a problem is to complete a project or start a project. So um, that's those are the five Ps. So when we tried... Most of this came up when we were working with the committees. We would try to work with them, okay? Because sometimes people get tunnel vision and they only think about um, permits. They only think about regulations. And sometimes you want to get them out. It's like, well, there's more more ways. Don't just think about regulations. When you're talking about economic development, it's not all about regulations. We can come up with programs and we can come up with policies and we can come up with other things. Think something outside. So that was why we had this broke out into these five P's and there'll be a little bit more explanation of that when we get to the final um, actual website, uh, the landing page and about the plan. We'll kind of talk about why we have it set up that way. Awesome. Thanks. Kind of the other. So I'll just grab one of the public safeties just so we've got it as a uh, as an example because they had uh, public safety was broken to four pieces. Originally, it was broken to five. One of them being emergency management. We've taken that one and given it to resilience. So it's now these four 
but because they tended, there really was no overlap in strategies. So it got very confusing when you lumped everybody together because you had all the goals and aspirations up front and then these long 11 pages of strategies that weren't very close to the goals. So by putting it together in this way, we've got our aspirations and goals here on the left, uh, including the six that the police have. Uh, the police, they're, um, they operate by the 20, uh, 21st, six pillars of 21st century policing. So that's why there are the six goals. Um, and as Maria had pointed out, the public safety tended to be a little bit more of an agency plan as opposed to a city plan. So it really is, what are our goals for our police department and how should they operate? And what are the strategies associated with them as opposed to maybe a community wide, but we can always go through and insert things. If there are public safety related things, we can certainly go through and, and target them into these as well. Um, That's okay. Can you remind me, did the did each department write these or how were these? I I put them together based on a lot of the information um that I could get out of uh the, the city reports and working with the, the police chief at the time. And then we put this together and kind of met with them to kind of go over what we what we saw and heard and there was general support that this is what they're looking for. And what they're comfortable with so um they're general enough that it doesn't put anyone into a corner but it also is specific enough that it helps them in grant writing because again like we said you can use plans to get grants so having things specifically in here that says we we want this or we need this whether it's um, a piece of technology or um in this case there they they felt it was important to renew the school resource officer now again that's their goal. We've left it in there. It'll eventually go to the, the city council for them to go through and consider. And it's a goal. It doesn't commit us or tie us to doing it. It's just that's their goal. They feel that is an important piece to their being successful as a police department. So that was a little bit why public safety came out a little bit differently. But um yeah, that's that's an interesting one to think about because I know there's a big movement at the school to remove the yep. school resource. And they did. So, <laughs> right. So the well, the community at large could feel a lot differently about that. Um, okay. um, but let's go back and at least see one that actually works for a storyboard. Um, I'll grab natural resources because that was the only one we didn't look at. So each one opens with a quick little um, thing, natural resources, protecting and stewarding Vermont's landscape. Um, and this has actually been fixed. They actually found out how to fix this. So this should be gone by tomorrow. Maybe that's why economic development isn't up. It's because they were fixing it. So they were going to be working on it today. Um, so Montpelier's unique natural settings influences both development patterns and the character of Montpelier. Our urban core is centered on the confluence of two rivers. Um, two major goals to protect and steward uh, Montpelier's landscape and natural resources, and two, to be a compact settlement with concentrated development, reducing development pressure on surrounding countryside. So one of our goals of natural resources is actually by being a compact settlement, we are protecting the rural countryside. Um, Development has to happen somewhere. Housing has to happen somewhere. If it's not happening here in our compact settlements, that's pushing it out into our into our natural resources. So it doesn't sometimes seem it seem like it on on its surface, but you think about it. Our our downtown helps us protect the natural resources that may be in Montpelier, but also may be in our neighboring communities. So the the second step, and you'll see along the top. These are in every single chapter, introduction, plan, context, synergies, implementation, summary, who's involved, and then there's an opportunity for feedback. Um, so I'm not going to read through all of these, but um, it the plan context is based around maps. So what we want, what we have for each one of our chapters is an opportunity, and these are interactive maps. You can move them around. 
And so um, in this case, we're talking about the city of Montpelier uses a natural resource inventory to maintain thorough and accurate records of environmental resources and hazards in Montpelier. So we can click on wetlands it, it will turn on the wetlands layer. And whatever you're working on, you can zoom in and actually see. So there's our designated downtown little dashed line. We've got a wetland here on Blanchard Brook. So you can move around. Um, that's kind of the advantage of these maps, it gives you the ability to kind of move around where the significant natural resources and they get highlighted. Um, streams and rivers, vernal pools, uh, development limitations. So you can click the buttons below to look at where we all know exists. It'll probably take a second to load steep slopes. Oh, come on, you can do it. So there's floodplains. Branch corridor, which would be up here. There's our north branch corridor. And deep slopes was working again. I'm wondering how much work they're working on right now because I talked with them this morning. I think they didn't realize Tuesday night we would be having a meeting. Um, but again, the idea is when the plan is all done, you're going to have the ability to move around and really see what are the issues and describe, you know, forest blocks and wildlife connectivity through the um, throughout the state. So we've got when the state talks about wanting to protect forest blocks, they actually have maps that show you where the forest blocks are. And this is the forest block. It actually connects mostly through what is called the Crest View up on Terrace Street. Um, and a little bit that comes in here, um, the interstate's kind of coming through. That's on Route 12 on Northfield Street. So, but this gives you the ability in whatever chapter you're looking at to go through and um, and we're updating a few of these layers. We want to clean up and have them kind of clip those off. So we've got a little bit of cleanup work to do. But for the most part, that's what the plan context is supposed to be trying to, to show you are where are the resources, let you really interact, zoom in on your house, see how close you are to a wetland or, or a steep slope and understand what's going on in the community. The synergies which I had mentioned before with economic development, this is where we try to talk about how does this natural resources impact other chapters? We've got 12 chapters. They overlap a lot. You've got transportation. You might have public transportation and your transportation infrastructure might impact economic development and your transportation infra infrastructure, transportation may also impact impact your energy plan because cars are a leading source of greenhouse gas. So you can't talk about transportation without talking about these other chapters. Natural resources impacts utilities and facilities, land use and transportation. Um, and it goes through your transportation is closely related to natural resources as transportation infrastructure and emissions can threaten environmental quality. For example, impervious surface runoff contributes to our increasing flooding and warming impacts on streams. Transportation emissions also contribute to air pollution and climate impacts. The traffic chapter addresses several of these, uh, 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 addresses several transportation related impacts, including runoff from impervious surface and broader impacts to promote low and no carbon transportation options. So again, this is um, how these come together. Um, with synergies, we talk about how they interact. In this case, only had three other chapters. Some of these synergies can be, have five or six chapters. Uh, and then the implementation summary, and these come directly out of that sheet we just looked at. We've got the aspiration, three goals, uh, actually one aspiration and six goals. And then the implementation summary is a written description of all of those strategies. So it just tries to summarize the strategies. So if you were to go through and just want to 
understand natural resources you could read and get through and then we would have a description of what's our goals and what are we doing about it and that's what this is described in here um they break if you were to look at all those strategies in the implementation plan you'd find they group into four different groups understanding the resources engagement um engagement with the community conservation and protection of resources so uh, that's how those tools, you might find a number of them in each one, but how do we, um, we can't protect the resources if we don't know where they are and what they are. So that's one thing. What is the Conservation and the Parks Commission going to do about developing uh, a natural resources inventory so we know what needs to be protected? Uh, the second piece is the engagement with the public. Uh, people protect what they understand. They, you know, if they don't understand it and they aren't informed about it, then they can't, they, they're less interested in um, participating to protect it. And whether that's creating volunteer programs um, or other initiatives, that's the second goal is engagement. The third being um, the green print initiative. That's the third major tool. And that's used in the parks commission. That's what lands are we going to buy and conserve or um, get easements on? And then the last piece is um, the impacts of, of development on natural resources. How do we protect it? And this is where the regulations come in. You need regulations if you're going to regulate stormwater runoff. Uh, you can have some programs that might do it, but really a lot of times you're adopting rules to protect stormwater runoff or these other uh, other pieces. So that's where the, the fourth set. And then who's involved? We've got various departments. We've got the tree board. We've got... Parks Commission, we've got Conservation Commission. So this kind of lays out who's involved in this, what departments, uh, planning department is involved in this, because we do NFIP, the National Flood Insurance, and we do Community Rating System, which protects our floodplains, and we enforce the regulations. Um, but it's the tree board that is doing the emerald ash borers and all these other programs to, to protect the urban uh, forestry. So that's how each one of these chapters is laid out. Um, certainly, if there are things we missed or things that are inaccurate, we're always looking for input. But the idea is for all 12 of these chapters that it's visually uh, interesting and appealing. And um, as I said, hopefully we get these these map little map issues fixed up because it's a lot nicer to look at these when they actually work. Um, but it's my fault for talking to them this afternoon about making changes. Uh -huh. So, and just as a reminder for, for anyone also who might be watching this, I mean, you, you can always email Mike yes. comments if you're not attending the public input sessions. So just let me. Yeah. On any of the 12, any of the 12 chapters. And hopefully, like I said, we'll get the last three chapters up in, in the next couple of weeks. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any other items you wanted to cover, but I'd love to just kind of go over the schedule sort of for the the plan going forward. And then thank approve, you, Laura. Thank you for coming. And then um approve the minutes and maybe even end a little early. <laughs> <laughs> um because I think we also want to plan a, you know some meetings. I think we haven't gone through Maria has been very good about going through the matrix and reviewing all the comments, but I am I am behind and I think we want a couple working sessions to make sure that we're can I get access to said oh, yes. matrix? <laughs> I will have to I will send you the connection to that. Yeah. Do you I, I would do you mind just sending all of us again access to that? Just so it's top of my inbox. Um and I think it's a Google sheet, right? Where we can enter in our own comments. Yeah. So that yes. that's helpful. We can and the expectation is just is that what we're gonna go over right now? Is the, is the... Oh no, no, no. <laughs> I, I was just I was just trying to like because I know that we are on a you know, we want to get this city plan done within a certain time and there's holiday, you know, there's always things that are coming up. So I just kind of wanted to review the schedule and also make sure that we have a, a few meetings to 
make sure that we're thoroughly reviewing the public comments. So yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good. So when Mike, do you think you'll have the next three chapters ready? Community services is already done. Um, resilience, as I said, I've got a draft of each. Um, it depends. I guess if we have time and you guys want to review it or we can have somebody take a look at it in the committee, you know, sometimes. I think it makes sense for us to look it over. Before. Look it over before we, yeah. you know. Yeah. So we'll try, I'll try to get those two ready. So probably the first meeting in December. Um, because we have one more meeting in November, and usually we've been doing three meetings on for public input. So we would have one more on these three chapters that we just did, and then we can, and if we have time, we can look at them at that time. But probably December, we'll have those other ones ready. Okay, so the last three are community service, resilience, and land use. And land use. And yep. land use is drafted? or Land no? use is not drafted. No. That's okay. the one I've started to put stuff together and get it to Nick so he could start making maps. He makes the maps, and then we send them to SE Group, who is our consultant who's actually building storyboards. So um, they're going to need the text and the maps, and then they put them together. Okay. And so, so usually we meet as a planning commission to talk about the text in a written out form and go through and say, do you guys like the text here? And yeah. they plug and play onto the website, and plug it in. So that one will be, will not, you're still working on it. It won't be ready. We will probably week. have to discuss it December 11th or whatever it is to approve the text. Then I can give it to them. So we might not have that public input session till maybe January because we'll have to approve it first amongst us for resilience and for yeah okay and right for land use then they can plug yes. it in build the website yeah okay that's what i thought you were saying for yeah. all three of them is that we needed to review the, but you're saying just resilience and land use just resilience and land use you guys already reviewed community service okay this community service does that have like the parks and recreation component that must have been before i that must have been a while so i don't remember ever doing i don't remember doing it Okay, good. So I was like, oh, I hope, hope we didn't do this whole thing without just the meeting or something. <laughs> but a senior community center. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Maybe you weren't at that meeting. Yeah. Okay. So, Mike, you think December 2nd? We would have we the, meet the second and no, uh, the 9th and the 20th. Well, the 23rd. Ninth, the 23rd. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. There you go. Um, I know. So we, we would hopefully try to do as much as we can <laughs> on the 9th, get everything done, because we probably won't meet the 23rd. And then that will give them the time. If they've got it after the 9th, they have it on the 10th, then they've got basically a month to put everything into the website and really build all the other pieces. Because I'm hoping that, as I said, this would be the last time that we have public input that's not in the the the, the, the landing page and the actual document we actually can right. start putting all the pieces in because people should be able to interact through all 12 documents now okay the so reason we didn't was because if we open them up to the website all we're going to get comments on is i clicked on land use and it doesn't it says error and i click on transportation it says error well yes because they're not on yet and we get that with this but <laughs> it would have been a lot worse if it was I um, went to about the plan and there's nothing there. It's like, no, I haven't built it yet. So the nine will be reviewing resilience and land use? And land use, we would have to, yeah. Okay. Um, and then we'll do the last public input for these chapters on November 23rd or something? Okay. Um, and then hopefully do public input for those part. The other two would have to be in January then. In probably. January. Yeah. November 25th or? Oh, 25th. Okay, thanks. Um, okay. I mean, could we also possibly tack on reviewing some of the matrix that meeting? Yeah. Just, you know. Yeah, yes. There's yeah. That would be heavy, good. Heavy public engagement. Yes. So we get some work done too. Yeah. Um, okay, and then the community service resilience land use, those public sessions would be in January, February, maybe. Um, and then, then we yeah. have to have a public hearing, right? And then, right, well, I then, know. Yeah, I then, then we've got to, 
have, yeah, then we'll have to have everybody say it's okay that any of the comments that we've gotten, now we've gotten through a lot of the comments. We've only gotten a handful of comments that are actual recommended changes that we have to go through. Laura had some, Tim had some here that we'll have to go through, uh, but we didn't get the list. Like we had, we did the first three and we had 105 yeah. comments yeah. that we had to go through. And we went through those. The next three, um, we had two chunks. We're still waiting to get energy chapter done. That's still. Oh, um, oh right. We, just... we approved all, we approved the other two, but we had a number of changes to energy plan, which I sent back to MIAC and MIAC was supposed to get back to me. Okay. So I'm going to have to check with them. Um, but we'll need to get some final, you guys to approve the final changes on, on the energy plan. Um, but then we've got these three chapters, which have had limited number of comments. So we don't have a lot to review there, but then we'll be, I'm sure we'll get a lot of comments on land, land use. use and resilience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping resilience will be pretty close. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a big topic. It's an important topic, but I don't think it's a controversial topic. Um, land use, though, can always be a controversial topic because that's where we start talking about items like the growth center and uh, those types of big, big issues. Although we've gotten through our big zoning change, so we're not uh, other communities when they've gone through, they've had these big land use plans where they want to make big changes to their zoning and they're putting them into their city plan or their town plan for the first time. So that can be controversial. In our case, we've kind of done it the other way and we updated our zoning and now we're plugging it into the city plan. So it should be a lot less controversial. Great. But, um, so when do we sort of, when are we, cause you know, after this, right, we'll have MIAC come back with the energy chapter. We'll have some more public comments. So we'll need to kind of I assume do some working and finalizing, but when then we have to have public hearings and remind me how many we have to have and like when I always I... have to look it up because okay. they make them state law for some reason makes them ever so slightly different between plans and zoning. And it's just enough for me to go through and say, I got to look it up. Okay. <laughs> so one of them, usually, usually it's like one planning commission and there has to be a 30 day wait and then city council has to have two but okay well maybe two public hearings but you can have more uh, but that's just the minimum is is those but as we yeah. said hopefully we we go through our public hearing um in what i guess would probably be early february at this point and if that goes well then you just make a motion to send it to city council and then we have as many hearings at council as council yeah, but it has to be finalized for it to go to a public hearing. I mean, we wait, we wait. Yes. Think that February is going to be us just making sure that we're all reviewing the whole plan and taking the comments into consideration. And then yep. so doing the final read, March. making sure yeah. everything okay. is right. And it'll all be uh, web based. We'll be able to click through and do everything, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then the sort of the hard deadline is to have it done by the end of. 2025 is that sort of 2025 but we would like to have it done earlier but again i've always said um the public hearings take as long as it takes mm -hmm. as yeah. long as you know uh i've had him spend a part of zoning updates where we've gone through and had our two required public hearings for zoning and made the made it adopted and i've had zoning amendments where we had 20 22 in in 2017, yes. 20, 22 public hearings, because it just, just, that's, as we say, it will take as long as it takes. Um, okay. So it's a good, go it's through a it. good reminder. So I want to leave it to the last minute. No, that's why, that's why we want to be done a year in advance, because if it turns out to be controversial, and we always think we're going to have 12 chapters. Um, and so far we've done nine. We had one, and surprisingly, only one that really needed to go back for major revisions. We still have three more chapters to go. We may get another one, um, but the thought being, we will just see how it how it goes. And when it goes to city council, um, they may have a different chapter that ends up being the one that holds things up and we need to make revisions. And they might send that chapter back to us to revise. So it could be two meetings and we're done. It could be six months. Um, but again, once it's to the public and the public input, it's really up to the public on how long it takes. 
agree. Thanks for reviewing that. So the hard deadline is the end of 2026. 2025. 2025. Okay. Yeah, we, so we got to have are, it adopted yeah. by December of 25. Okay. Yeah. Woo. Okay. That's really once we once it's to the city council, that's really on the city council. Yeah. Once once it's through there, yeah. you guys are done. You guys are going to participate. <laughs> Um, but hopefully, as we said, once it gets to city council, hopefully if we've done our job well, the public has been aware of it. They've had a year. We've talked about this for months. Um, you know, we'll, we'll ramp up our, our input. Once we've got a public hearing draft, we can work with Evelyn about ramping up and pushing a lot of, a lot of notice out to it, make sure the public knows. So hopefully the goal is when it gets to city council, it's been vetted and people have heard about it. Nobody's coming in to go and say, I didn't even know this was happening. All right, well, now's your opportunity. Let's, you know, hopefully we've addressed it. But because we've worked with the committees, our hope is that we're pretty close. You know, uh, the housing committee helped write the housing chapter. The energy committee is helping to write the energy chapter. Most of our biggest players hopefully have already participated. And we did, there was an article in the bridge about the city plan, right? There have been a couple over the years because yeah. we've been doing it since 2016 now. Yeah, but I mean, a recent yes. in the past year article, I'm trying to think. I think it was before I think our there first was. public input session. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but we'll be back to work with them, the bridge and, and the folks to try to make sure we get yeah. as much out as we can. But it'll be a lot easier once we've got a final draft and we've got something all put together. And we've tested it and it works and it doesn't surprise me in a public hearing again. <laughs> uh, that's yeah. That's my fault. All right. Does anyone should we look at the minutes of October twenty eighth? Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. I know. Oh, oh, so I, I oh yeah. Do you have any? Yeah. <laughs> pretty trimmed. Yeah, they are pretty trimmed. I know this. Is, this is silly. It may be silly, but. I don't actually think I made a motion to adjourn because I don't think I make motions anymore. <laughs> but I don't know who did. I usually. I don't know if we really need to memorialize see. that because we definitely made a successful motion to adjourn. <laughs> I'm not, uh, not worried October, about that. October 28th. My note said Sean made it and Gabe seconded. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, does anyone want to move approval of the minutes with that correction? Okay, I move again. As oh, corrected, oh, as corrected, sorry. oh, sorry. As I, so now we just need a second. I missed that you moved it before. I didn't quite hear you. Okay. I will second based on that amendment. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Okay, and I think make a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Maria. Second. Gabe. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks you. Thanks, Sean.